Today we're very pleased to have some special guests with us. We've invited, and our speaker especially wanted us to invite, first responders from our community. And at this time I'd like to ask those special guests to please stand so that our community can express our appreciation.
to get through running our trucks and doing our chores, uh, leisure time, watching the TV, and as it turned it on, saw all this fire and everything in this building in New York, you know, and uh, I said, my goodness, I realized kind of what was going on, and uh, so I went in the police department, got our uh, police chief out of there, and I said, hey, come in here and look at this. Well, we ran in there, and we sat there, and as we sat there, the second plane hit the other tower, and, uh, you know, you sit there and think, you know, if I was on duty up there, here I would be right in the very middle of it, and how thankful we are to have people around the country that can do, do the things that they do, and it uh, was a very sad time. My husband, ex-husband, was stationed at, still oh, at Camp Lejeune, and when we heard about we were living on base housing, and all the wives had to get together, get in a vehicle, and try to get to the main base they could get us in the shelter, because we weren't 100% sure if we were a target or not at that time. And then afterwards, when we went home, we all had to pack up all of our husband's belongings to get them ready by the door, because they were leaving. And it was like one of the hardest times for all the wives. I was in Center, Texas. I work at Crenshaw Price Center in Smith. My mother called me and she said, you have to turn the TV on. She said, America's been attacked. And she said, you have to start praying now. Were you in New York? Yeah, I was in Hi, I'm Ronnie Morton. I was on duty at the Marshall Fire Department at the time. Uh, we watched the first plane hit, or they did, and then they called us. We all went back to the back, we were watching. Second plane hit, and all of a sudden we get toned out for an Amtrak terrain derailment. Now, we don't know if that's part of it or not. So. You know, and that's also when we found out that there's mile post on train tracks because they kept giving us a mile post and we didn't know where it was. So we finally found out where it was. It was between Marshall and Hallsville on Munch Cutoff. <clears throat> we got out there and ended up transporting about 20 patients from there, having to get up on the train and get them off because the train had actually missed a red block. And I'll tell you why in just a second. But he had laid that Amtrak train over on its side. So we were getting them out of there. And just two months before that, we found out we'd get school buses to help transport the non-injured because uh, about a month, two months before that, we'd had a bus wreck out on the interstate and found out that's a good way to transport people. So you call your school buses. But the train engineer had actually missed a red block. And that's just like a red light out on the highway. He was watching a TV, which is illegal in a train. It's against federal regulations. And he missed the red block, and the other train hadn't cleared the, the tracks yet, and that's what caused it to lay over. But at the time that we got the tone out, we weren't sure what it was. You know, was this part of it or not? So we're, we're thinking the whole thing. So we didn't get to see the actual collapsing of the towers, but we did see the second plane hit, and then we got toned out and got busy. So that's where we were. Anyone else? Is he even still on? I think he died. How many of you that are faculty and staff were at Panola College when it happened? I was in the library. Phyllis Reed was the library director. Is this on? Are we dead? Is it going up there? Is that better? That Don Clinton came flying into the library because we had a student in the dorms whose dad was in the Air Force and he had been put on alert. But as, some, as you had mentioned, all at once we couldn't get on the internet, we couldn't get 
the only place on campus that we could access satellite television was in the old pit lab in the library. And we couldn't get anything to come up on any of the stations until half the day was over. So we remember it vividly. How many of you don't remember it at all? You've seen the CNN reports and things like that, but you may not know. <laughs> Please help me welcome Dr. Allie Davis. and youth out of you just to look at all these inspired faces and different stages in their life trying to be somebody with goals and all the glitter in their eyes. What's going on, buddy? <laughs> Sorry for being late. Uh, we always have something going on. And any of you want to be a physician here? Anybody? Because I want to convince you otherwise. <laughs> you will never be on time you are always going to be running late, but it's a great profession. <laughs> anyway, but back to why I'm here, you know, I'm here to talk about September 11th and uh, my kind of quest. I was a paramedic for about 10 years and uh, I did it to get through the med school, so I hope you're doing the same. If not, come over, I'll teach you. And uh, as I was sitting down and I was trying to create a PowerPoint presentation, I guess it's a good thing I didn't. It brought tears to my eyes, you know, how much pain and uh, overall what a disaster and how much we faced on that day. It wasn't easy for anyone and we're still recovering. It's not over yet and it will never be over and it will never be forgotten, okay? We'll learn the lesson, you know, and we'll be stronger than ever. And let's just say, it, it's, it's a process. It's a process of healing. It's a process, it's a path, I would say. And uh, with a God's blessing, I wanna make sure we all appreciate every single day when you can wake up, you get off your bed, and actually see the daylight because some of us are not fortunate for whatever reason and overall if you think about firefighters police officers and uh, the whole rescue personnel whether it's medical or whoever they are they're doing an excellent excellent job day and night they protecting us from whatever can come their way and it's not that they're trained in everything. There is no such a thing as we know everything. Just as physicians, trust me, I don't know everything. We have limitations, and the main limiting factor is that we are humans. We have inborn ability to make mistakes. We're not perfect, okay? And what, what's important is that we'll learn from our mistakes we get up and we keep going. But I really want to make sure we guys say a big thank you. Anytime you see a firefighter or police officer on the street, just remember these people doing everything they can to get you home safe and protect you. And I see we have some personnel and please let us support them. <laughs> involved in our lives, okay? We go to school, we work, we teach, we, 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 we kind of do what needs to be done from our point of view, but we have to also appreciate the 
personnel that's out there on a daily basis doing this amazing, amazing, great job. When I, when I had a chance to actually be part of the rescue team, I'm like, oh man, great people, great writers, great actors, great teachers, overall different types of personalities. That they're not just police officers, they're not just EMS, they're not just rescue workers. They're individuals with great talent, with families, that they also want to come home to at the end of the day, okay? And if you guys show that little respect, that little care, uh, I like it will go a long way. Now, I personally, if I could, I would still be a firefighter. I think it's great. It's just, you, you almost become this adrenaline junkie. You get so much energy. You, it, it's a drug, you know. It's a drug, it's an addiction. It's really difficult to lose because it, it just gets you excited, you know. It just, you feel you're making a difference in someone's life. And it just, it's so rewarding, you know. When that baby's born and when you, when you do something small, but made that little small for you is something very big for somebody else. Now, I joined fire department when I was 18 years of age. I couldn't do it earlier because it's just illegal to turn. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking maybe it's because the drink I threw their long shift, but it wasn't that. <laughs> it's just something that, you know. But anyway, I joined the EMT course or EMT class when I was 17. Graduated when I was 18, worked as an EMT, became a paramedic. And of course, it happened to be that I graduated August 2001 as a paramedic, as a brand new enthusiastic individual who had this little shiny badge with his name on it that no one can read. <laughs> <laughs> but besides that, not a Smith or a Caleb. <laughs> okay. So, and you know, and, and all of a sudden they assigned to this brand new truck with an individual who has been working as a paramedic for many years and he's supposed to pass the ropes and teach you everything. And I was very excited. I was very excited, you know, to be sitting to a knowledgeable paramedic and learn everything on a daily basis. And September 11th, you know, the way the whole day started out, it was a beautiful, beautiful sunny day, 70 degrees, nice breeze, typical New York City temperature, everybody doing their own thing, nobody worries about anything but get to work and how to not to say I'm sorry or, you know, how to just push somebody and keep going like it's normal. <laughs> if any of you ever end up in New York City, it's normal not to let people off the elevator. <laughs> that's just how we do things. And it's not being able to just get in New Yorker. And people were doing their own obviously daily routine, working, school. And then, you know, I don't know where around 8 30 when the first plane hit the building, the whole chaos just unveiled and people were confused. People did not know what to do, where to run. It was just a, just a very, very sad day in our lives. You know, all the roads, all the bridges were shut down. People just did not how, know how to live in New York City. Literally, they were stuck. And the only way to get out was to take a ferry or to walk across the bridge. And let us say, just the way People remember when Kennedy got shot. I can tell you, every New Yorker and most of you guys remember what exactly you were doing or where you were supposed to be that day. And I was trying to put a collage of pictures, and uh, it really brought tears to my eyes just to see the pain and what we got through. But it's a true blessing, and I hope you know we can praise the Lord and thank Him for. Uh, everything you've done for us to recover from this and to become stronger and to learn our lesson. And we just need more God in our lives. You know, that's one of the reasons why I came from New York City, to, to meet all of you guys. <laughs> it meant to be. Uh, but overall, again, uh, as I mentioned, it was a, just a terrifying experience. I hope none of you will ever have to face it. But what I'm really 
proud of and happy is the fact that we have great, great police department all over the states. I'm talking about New York City, Texas. We have a great organization, and uh, I want you guys to believe in that. I don't want you to necessarily listen to the media and what's being portrayed because politicians will always be politicians. But I want you to be a human, okay? I want you to take everything with a grain of salt, and when you go home, treat your family, you know, like this is the last day you've seen them. Because we've lost over 400 uh, rescue workers that day. Some of them I went to work with that day, you know, hoping for a nice slow day with just a little excitement, which is pretty usual. So, taking things for granted can definitely be a curse. And uh, be respectful, be mindful. And overall, I think it's so important to be together, okay? And you have to make sure you listen to your heart and what Lord Almighty tells you. You know, we, we have to get through this together. Unity is what makes us stronger. By no means, you know, there's one individual or an I and we're a team, okay? But uh, my path, again, I, I'm not a hero. I'm just a regular college student who graduated from paramedic school. You know, I actually got my degree and happened to be part of, you know, very chaotic and great tragedy that, you know, I'll carry on with. Uh, but it's been 15 years, New York City recovered, like you wouldn't believe it. Uh, but we still remember every single day like it happened yesterday. And we will always remember it and we'll always keep those people in our hearts because, you know, it's very important to remember what they've done to us and how much imprint they've left. Uh, on the day of September 11, you know, the dust the smoke was so overwhelming. So many people have lost their lives. And, and the whole chaos of trying to have that hope that your family member is still alive. But inadvertently, you know that that's probably not the case. You know, and seeing those faces, but having hope is what carried those hearts and still with us today. And um, overall, I feel, again, as a, as, a, as, a, as a community, we will grow stronger and we will be strong. Just as a curiosity, how many are college students from this facility? Are you guys all freshmen or is it just a mix of all? What is it? Oh. Mixed. Mixed? Well, again, guys, you know, this, is, this is the beginning. This is your foundation. Okay? You, today, you build is what you're going to stand on for the next many, many decades. So, and I'll tell you one thing for sure, being nice, respectful, grateful, and appreciative to what God gives you will take you a long way, okay? Just remember that it's a really tough world out there. There's a lot of evil, and there's a lot of people who are just out there to hurt or to create chaos. And you cannot fight them, as you can see with all this ISIS and all these terrorist groups. It's a very large underground, you know, plague that we've been fighting. But nobody can fight anything on their own. And you being united, you being part of the bigger picture is what will make us great, okay? It's very important that you guys all stay together and that you provide love and care to each other and support each other in every step you make. You don't have to be a president like Trump, who knows. I'm not against to be a politician. <laughs> but he's a New Yorker, okay? And he actually grew up in my neighborhood. But I'm nothing like that, and I have a bit more hair. <laughs> and it does not stand up. <laughs> so, but, what I'm trying to say is that, again, don't try to succeed and leave your other half behind. You always have friends who will admire you for being healthy.
helpful and who will be very grateful if you can help them to succeed. Not all of us are leaders, as you would know. Not all of us can be leaders. Not all of us have the personality to be a leader. Okay, but if we all help each other, you'll be amazed how this little one over here could be president in the next few decades, okay? He might have less hair, he might have more mean, but he can get it. And that might be what you're helping. Okay, who knows? And he'll thank you and he'll appreciate it. And he will be blessed and very happy to have a buddy like yourself next year. Okay? But and I'm trying to kind of again jump from one topic to another because it's not easy just to kind of tell you exactly what you should know or would want to know about September 11th because it, it's a very painful event that unveiled and, and, and it's just not necessarily something I would want anyone in this room to live or have experience of, of exactly knowing what happened that day. But what I do want you to know is that we all stood together like never before, even though we had to break into McDonald's and eat in the middle of the night because at that point everything was closed and we still had to provide the rescue work. And, and what's really important that you guys understand and respect all our law enforcement officers, regardless of what you hear in the media, because media portrays and, and sort of kind of sometimes can deviate toward one side or another based on what the belief of that particular station or group. And I want you to be very open-minded because what you hear is not necessarily what occurs. And uh, always give a benefit of a doubt or a chance to the other person to explain themselves or to hear that, what they have to say. But, but again, for, for that particular day, September 11th, again, we stood together like it was, it was just made to be, and everybody worked in synchrony, fire department, police department, even sanitation. Sanitation played such an important role because now you have all this debris, hot melted beams of steel that have to be carried out. And um, it wasn't easy. Let me tell you something. When you have two buildings that literally were pulverized into dust of glass, human flesh, metal, stove and it's all in the air, you can only imagine what it's like to break or work in a setting like that, you know, to provide rescue work and overall just to clean up the scene. It was a very challenging task and it took time. Even in October, months past, we still had projects to carry on. We still had a lot of cleanup. We still had a lot of people who dedicate their lives. And what we realize in these days, which of course nobody knew about before, is that all that pulverized glass and metal and human flesh causes cancer. And now we deal with repercussions of that and people actually have malignancies that we've never heard before people can actually get. But then we're respectfully speaking when we look at all the exposure people sustain, or the rescue workers sustain, or even the neighbors, even the people who live in the community, nobody was fully aware what are the damage and effects of the dust, you know. So let's just say we're still dealing with this repercussions and, and kind of the pain that we went through with the first round. Uh, but again, Overall, I think we have recovered and we will always remember those great, great rescue workers and all the people, all 2,500 of them who went to work saying, see you later, honey, to their family members whenever they came back. Okay. So, uh, we'll do pretty good actually. So overall, again, you know, it, it, it's really important not to take for granted what you have and where you are. But it's
just so refreshing and I'm so glad to be here because it, it, it's amazing to see this souls, this young minds, the future of this country to actually build the foundation of where we're going to stand tomorrow. And I want to make sure you guys are aware, every single soul in this room is important. Okay, from this little guy to the one with a headset, we're probably going to be an M&M. &M. <laughs> it's, you all carry a message. You're all very, very important, okay? And uh, it seems like it's big nothing in just a geometry or statistics class or just uh, some biology class. It sounds trivial and unimportant. And the, the, the theory behind, behind chaos is that you're not seeing a full picture until a few years will pass by. And that's when you're going to realize how important was that EMT class that you attended, or how important was that statistics class that you attended. Because that's what's going to determine which way you're going to go. Not all of you may be doctors, and I don't want you to all be doctors, otherwise I'm going to retire early. <laughs> some of you will be engineers, some of you will be pilots, some of you will be, again, there's so many some of you, and as long as you take it seriously, and as long as you continue exploring and challenging yourself on a daily basis, you will find what really meant for you. I didn't want to be a doctor, I just wanted to be a paramedic. I love what I was doing. It's a great job, it's a very rewarding job. But what you realize, as you build your foundation and put stone over stone, you realize that you want to challenge yourself, okay? You want to be something bigger, you want to grow. And you don't have to be a doctor. You can always advance in a career of managing you can always become a lieutenant, a captain. Lots of people in my field become just, you know, again, managing officers, and they carry a very important role. Whatever you do, just remember, the seeds you plant right, right now will grow to big trees later, okay? Any questions, because obviously, I see all this excited souls and all this bright eyes and just, could you walk us through the day the call came in to your, to your station? And oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm actually, the only reason why I'm here is because my shift did not start till 11.30 that morning. And uh, my windows, actually, where I used to live, my windows used to face Twin Tower on the right, and I would have a Statue of Liberty in the left lower corner. And you know, you have your routine, you young, you work hard, you party hard. <laughs> That's not what I did. <laughs> I was studying for my algebra very late. <laughs> because I was going to my undergraduate classes and working full time for a medic as well, because I'm just a type A personality. And wasn't starting until 11.30 that morning. Of course, I did not wake up until 11.30. I woke up around 8 o'clock. Quickly, I had a cup of coffee and went back to bed because I just couldn't get out. It was a tough day, tough day. But then I realized my phone was just bombarded with missed phone calls around 8.45. I noticed that. And then I looked out of the window before I went calling back anywhere. I see the smoke coming out of the south tower. I was like, this is a little strange and unusual. What is going on? This is just very typical. So of course I call back my lieutenant. And he tells me, where are you? We've been calling you all morning. We, we, we have major deployment. You know, we have a plane that crashed into the South Tower. At that point, nobody knew if this was an act of terrorism or if this was just a very bad, tragic accident. So, of course, I jumped into my car and I 
drive as fast as I can to the nearest station where I got deployed. Uh, and as my truck was going through a battery tunnel, the first building collapsed actually. Uh, believe it or not, nobody expected, nobody in their mind thought that the building can collapse. They were built to stand no matter what, and nobody had even slightest idea that this could have happened. So when, when the triage happens, when people set up the triage, and the triage is the area where you take all the people who got injured, it was set up by the buildings. Firefighters went into the buildings with no fear that the building might collapse. Nobody even had second thought that that might happen. Unfortunately, it did. And then when the first tower collapsed, you know, the south tower, that's when we realized the extent of this well-planned terrorist attack. That's when we started pulling back people into the safety zone because that's when we came to realization nothing made to stand forever. And everything can be damaged with enough force. So that's kind of where, that's why I'm still here, because I got deployed a little bit later than what some people unfortunately had to. So again, the first building collapsed as it was going through the battery tunnel, and then as we pull out of the battery tunnel, you see absolutely nothing but this white fog. Nothing, that's it. You just smell burning flesh and just dirt in the air to the point where you can't see, can't breathe, because all the polarized glass, it just burned your eyes, it burned your lungs, it was just unbearable. So that's kind of how I entered Manhattan, it was a big note, a big disaster to face, but it made everybody realize that if the first building went down, it's very possible that the second building might go down as well. And that's when we obviously decided to have a different strategy than what we had before. Now the plan was from rescue going into the buildings to pull everybody you can out of the buildings as fast as you can because the second building can do the same. Unfortunately, when the buildings were designed, they were designed in a way that they would not collapse. But because the planes had so much diesel and so much burning fuel in them, it melted the beams. And the building started collapsing like a domino effect, floor by floor. And that was not something that anyone necessarily was expecting and could have predicted. So, unfortunately, with the, with the first building down, we realized that it's time to pull back and reassess where do we stand and how do we approach this. Now, of course, pulling back, when we're talking about 8 million people living in New York City, and you have people from New Jersey and all of all other borders commuting into Manhattan, to work, you can only imagine how difficult it is to get all these people back out of the New York City. So it was a very challenging task at that point to pretty much provide any risk because it was more of a grab and go and whoever could walk had to walk and whoever had to be carried was carried. But let's say people were very helpful. Even strangers would be helpful because you had to have a lot of manpower to be able to actually evacuate that large population. Now, once the second building collapsed, the rest became more cumbersome in the sense that we did not have that many people that could have been rescued under the rubble 
because all the hot metal, all the fumes, all the gases, you can only imagine the temperature of, of what was under the buildings, it was thousands of degrees. If we were able to melt the building, you can only imagine what would have happened to the people underneath. So the rescue was, was kind of very cumbersome once the building collapsed because there was not much to rescue. And we tried till the month of October. We had dogs, we had rescue teams. But at that point, it was pretty terminal. And deep inside, we all knew that whoever was able to come out, came out, and whoever was left behind probably was not coming out at that point. But uh, even till late October, we had rescue trucks hoping and being there on a daily basis with a hope, with a hope that there'll be still someone. And nobody was left behind as we would expect. So for me, again, yeah, it, was, it was a very different day than it would have turned out to be if I was deployed early because, again, we were not aware that the buildings could collapse. Nobody came out of the truck with a thought that that can happen. And that kind of obviously changed the strategy, or would have changed the strategy at that time. Now, in terms of rescue, it was very difficult to evacuate all these people from one little island. And as you can only imagine, people running for their lives. And that ability to coordinate care and kind of have sense of direction kind of being taken over by primitive instinct to run for life is different because when there's a chaos, people go from organized mode of let's all walk in a straight line to I'm running wherever I can. And that was another challenge that we all had to face to be able to actually get some sense back into people and say, hey, you're safe. Just follow us, follow the directions, and we'll get you out of here. Okay? But uh, I'm very proud of you guys. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult task you face, especially not knowing what you might walk into and how difficult it can be. And uh, again, it, it was a really, really difficult day for family members who lost their significant others uh, and for rescue you know, uh, personnel because that day we as a rescue team we've lost over 400 staff members mainly because of unexpected events that took place and um, it was difficult, it was very difficult to know or to be aware that it was going to happen because once that rubble fell down, it fell with the force, with the force and with the heat, and um, we knew that we were those quite a few people that day. But uh, that's kind of my story, you know, it's fairly simple in the sense that I'm only here because, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, I, I was not deployed early enough because otherwise I probably would be in the same building running and doing what I was told to. But I guess maybe it wasn't my time. Maybe it was meant for me to come and share the story with you. Okay. Who knows? You know? He has planned for all of us, one would say. I want you guys to pray to, on September 11th for all the people who are lost. Okay? Because unity is what makes us stronger. And we need God right now more than we ever did. Okay? And all I want to 
share and tell you. I apologize for my late entrance. There was a long drive, and uh, my entourage, Jason, I want to thank him for bringing me here. If it wasn't for him, I probably would be still lost somewhere. <laughs> In New York City, everything's named and it's all streets and numbers. Here, yeah, it's just a little bit different. <laughs> and the distance is also a little bit different. Okay, but Jason, thank you so much for bringing me here. He played a huge role in, in my actually adaptation to East Texas. Okay, and I want to thank all the organizers of this event. And I'm really sorry for being late. I really appreciate you inviting me to talk to you. Again, I don't really have much to say, or maybe I just have a block, and I don't want to tell you all the details because I don't think it's worth for you guys to know all of that. Some of it should not be told. But I really appreciate you being here, and I hope to some point or to some degree you can understand what we've been through, the struggle, and how important it's for us to be all together. Okay? Thank you.